Um, I'm just going to talk about Kubernetes cluster bootstrap at my company on AWS. So I'm not covering. I'm covering a very small uh, slice of that huge pie. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a different uh, scenarios you might need to bootstrap either locally. Um, you could use hosted clusters. Like if you use local, a, a great example is Minikube. Recently also. Uh, Docker added, um, you know, the, the Edge version. You can actually run um, Kubernetes within Docker for Mac. I haven't played around with it much. It just uh, messed up my, my Kubernetes client. I was not happy. <laughs> 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 um, then um, there's Hosted. Um, so there's a Google Container Engine, um, Azure, and Amazon announced um, uh, EKS, which is, um, I guess, not generally available yet, right? Um, so that those are the options. Um, I'm not going to endorse anything. Um, then turnkey cloud solutions. Um, so there's a lot of um, projects that actually allow you to run Kubernetes very quickly um, on one of these like um, clouds. And one of them is AWS, which is the one that we are using, which is basically the focus of this talk. Um, then there are on-prem solutions, which I'm not going to cover at all. And actually, um, there's a member here. I'm just Few people. I mean, who here runs Kubernetes on bare metal? Okay, so we have several people. So that might be an interesting uh, follow-up talk because uh, you face different problems, right? <laughs> um, so when we started to look for a bootstrapping solutions, uh, we knew that we like uh, CoreOS uh, mm -hmm. and um, and Terraform. So this is basically ideally what we would like to use, and. Um, First thing I looked at was uh, Cube AWS, which was a project from CoreOS. I found some very old website where people were discussing about it. Uh, I, from my top of my head, so without actually looking at the the latest status of that project, it was a lot of custom YAML. Um, but in a way that I, I at the time I thought was not appropriate, and um, it probably evolved since. Um, but it was not Terraform, so <laughs> um, it was nice, but. Mm, not great. And then uh, we started with um, this project called TAC, which uh, TAC is a term in sailing when you tack from one side to the other side, just for your information. And because I wrote like a blog, uh, not a blog, I wrote like an internal uh, Confluence article about this and I was putting pictures of ships going across board and my colleague was, what is this? That's what it means, TAC. Okay, so um, anyway. So this uh, is using CoreOS and Terraform, so that was uh, right. We, we loved it. The, the problem was it was using Terraform back in when it was version 0 0.7. And uh, I don't know if you've used Terraform for a long time, but it was OK. But like the remote state support wasn't really great. Um, at the time, also, when you download Terraform, you get a huge binary which has all of the providers. So if you use AWS or GitHub or everything, that's all compiled in a single Terraform binary. And uh, the, there, was, there was no or as far as I remember, we didn't use any of the, uh, the, the TLS cer certificate generation or templating with it. Um, the local providers were not as advanced as they are right now. We were having a lot of troubles with it. There was um, a lot of bash scripting around it. And, um, and actually, we didn't maintain it that much. So we were doing a lot of manual things outside of the, the project, which wasn't ideal. Um, it was also the way that, that we, we run at CD. We, uh, we didn't do a, a proper at CD setup, so we, we lost cluster state a few times. Uh, managing and doing rolling upgrade of at CD was complicated. Um, and also, upgrading Kubernetes versions was manual and slow. It wasn't great. But I mean, it helped us get things running on Kubernetes initially. Uh, then in 2016, a lot of exciting projects. I mean, after Docker uh, announced Swarm and um, kind of highlighted the issue that a lot of people were facing with the bootstrapping or the actual initialization part of Kubernetes. Uh, with Swarm, you just had to do Docker Swarm in it, and, and there you go. So um, that was um, picked up by the Kubernetes community as well to, to, to build a lot of additional um, things such as uh, Kube Admin, which I think, uh, yeah, which is that topic here. So Kube Admin was announced not long after Swarm init was created. Sorry, uh, we started. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Cube Admin was announced not long after the Docker announced Swarm to kind of uh, automate a lot of the things of uh, bootstrap process, managing TLS certificates and things like that. However, when we were looking at uh, you know revamping our 
bootstrapping process. Um, this status of, of Cube Admin was very, like, there was no support for high availability. Uh, it's still in alpha. So um, we had to kind of discard that option. Uh, there was also COPS, um, which uh, originally was like called UpUp, Up, uh, which, which was um, integrated within the Kubernetes um, main repository. So it became like an incubated project, I believe. So under Kubernetes um, uh, organization, you have the COPS um, uh, repository. And, um, and its tagline is to manage clusters the Kubernetes way. And I'll try to highlight that uh, in the, the remaining of the slides. Who is familiar with COPS? Who has used COPS? Chaos. Sorry, nobody. Great. <laughs> so uh, there's also uh, an exciting proposal from CoreOS um, talking about how to self-host, so to create a temporary control plane to create a cluster, and um, and and it and this self-hosting proposal is actually a core component of CoreOS Tectonic. CoreOS Tectonic. Um, so. That's the commercial offering from CoreOS to, pr to manage Kubernetes clusters. And they, the, the idea here is to provide enterprise-ready Kubernetes clusters. Uh, it's, um, it's based on uh, Container Linux, so CoreOS, the original operating system that they uh, released, uh, which are great um, to create a fleet of, uh, of, of servers that then can self-update, that can coordinate reboots across the cluster to, to make sure that your um, services uh, stay up. I mean, that your nodes are also refreshed and um, keep up with the latest security updates. Um, it's integrated with, um, I mean, they, they open sourced a component called DEX, uh, which is like a daisy chain to provide um, yeah, int like, uh, authentication to the Kubernetes uh, cluster. So uh, you can integrate with LDAP, which is great for the enterprise, or you can integrate with um, any provider, authentic uh, identity provider supported by DEX. So it can be um, GitHub or Gm or Google. Actually, for Google, you don't need DEX because you can integrate Google um, domains directly to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, then CoreOS comes also with a, like a management console. And um, it's beautiful. You, you, you just click a few buttons. You upgrade your Kubernetes cluster version, everything. It's wonderful. And I really wanted it. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we didn't. Um, well, like we, we negotiated a while with uh, CoreOS, but um, we didn't come to a point where we actually were able to adopt it. Um, but it's a very exciting framework. Um, so that was enough advertisement, I think. <laughs> OK, so I think, yeah. Actually, one of the interesting parts when you start playing with CoreOS Tectonic is that it's fully built in Terraform. They initially created like a Terraform version 10 patched version to achieve what they needed to be able to do. So they, they built like their own Terraform uh, binary, uh, bundled it with CoreOS, uh, sorry, with the Tectonic uh, solution. And uh, when you look into the Tectonic, uh, sorry, in the Tectonic source code or the Terraform configurations, it, they use very interesting features. And uh, there's a lot to learn of how they use Terraform. So I did spend a lot of time to study it and uh, play with the vanilla mode, the, the, the free version. Um, but yeah, um, also the fact that once you, you um, engage CoreOS uh, to get Tectonic, they will work together with you. They will dedicate engineers to work on, on certain um, components. And Ticketmaster is one of the customers, and they open sourced an application load balancer controller for uh, AWS. So that's also very interesting. Um, so, um, and it has also grown a lot. So we, we haven't um, played with the latest version. Uh, sorry, that's that's more about Terraform itself having better uh, state backend support. Um, the modules um, are there is like a module registry now that you can push and pull from. So Terraform itself has improved a lot since we uh, last used it. So yeah, more praise to Tectonic. Maybe I should stop <laughs> talking about that. Um, but overall, very interesting project. I learned a lot by going through it. So. This next bit of slides is to talk a little bit more about a uh, self-hosted control plane proposal. Given due to the fact that we don't have, like I basically, basically have like 10 minutes left, I'm not going to go into the self-hosted um, uh, I concept of, of Kubernetes. Um, so I'm, I'm skipping these slides. And I do want to highlight a couple of very interesting um, projects, which is um, using this um, this kind of advanced way of, of, of bootstrapping a cluster. Uh, and we couldn't use those because they weren't, uh, they were like basically very, very young by the time we started working on it. But if I were to do it again, I would definitely start to look at these, which are uh, Typhoon, 
uh, which is a minimum and uh, free Kubernetes distribution. It uses Terraform. It has custom Terraform um, um, modules that, uh, that prepare Bootcube. And there's also Archon, which is an operator, as we talked earlier about operators, which is a way to, um, an, like an expert system to manage like um, an, an existing, uh, another system. So for example, we talked a little about an Elasticsearch operator, so the operator would manage the nodes and, and like the, um, the whole cluster creation. The same way uh, Archon, I believe the idea is to basically give it a Kubernetes um, cluster definition and Archon will go ahead and create it. So it's kind of like an operator for clusters uh, based on, on the Bootcube uh, project. So uh, it sounds very, very cool. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time to play with that. Um, so we couldn't create multi... Oh, there was one big, yeah, one big problem with Tectonic, why we didn't go with it was at the time we, we were using it, you had to create a separate Tectonic installation for each cluster. Uh, and I wanted to use Terraform workspaces, basically a way to isolate state using uh, Terraform workspaces. So you, you keep the same Terraform configuration and you just point it at different uh, state files and it, uh, it's able to create um, similar clusters, I mean identical clusters, but for different uh, environments. So you can create like a production cluster, a staging cluster, or another production cluster if you want. So that was one of the reasons I didn't, I, I wanted to, I, that was something that I felt was lacking in Tectonic. And because I, um, I, had to, I wanted to use the vanilla mode, a lot of components uh, we had to um, like, like find replacements for, and we had to study a lot, and it took a lot of time. So, so we let go of that idea, and we decided to go with Chaos. So Chaos is a project um, that is now endorsed by Kubernetes, uh, kind of. And it basically allows you to define clusters in code. You, you, you give it a, a cluster spec manifest. You give it a couple of instant group definitions. And uh, it will go out and, and generate or create those, um, you know, those cloud um, components that you need to create those clusters. It manages secrets for you as well. We haven't to play too much with that. Um, it manages uh, the, boot, boot the node boot sequence. Uh, manages uh, etcd in high availability mode. So um, our, our recovery mode for our old clusters is pretty bad. Like we didn't have an uh, easy way to recover for etcd. With, with Kops, um, it kind of creates an auto-scaling group of a single master per, per master. And so if the, ma if the machine goes away, um, it gets automatically re replaced. And then uh, automatically the etcd data is reattached to that node and, and the, the node is joining the cluster again. So it has this auto uh, recovery mode much better than what we had before. Uh, we didn't have a very good story for that. And then um, we played a lot with add-ons channels, which is uh, what I hope to demo. I hope I have some time for that. Um, so. You know, Kubernetes is uh, like a base system, and you have a couple of add-ons, such as a dashboard or uh, a DNS. Even the DNS, which every Kubernetes cluster uses, as far as I know, uh, is an add-on. You don't have to use it. You can use something else. So um, channels is a tool to manage those. So here I like to, to exemplify why they say, like, manage clusters the Kubernetes way. So if you look at Kubernetes, on one side we have the client. We have a etcd, which is basically a database or a state storage. And we send manifest through an API server, which stores it into the storage. And controllers are notified or watched for uh, manifests, such as the operator controller or other controllers, uh, replication controllers, and things like that. And they talk to the cloud provider, which then create cloud resources. Like if we create a service manifest, we, create a, uh, we get a load balancer. If we, um, like things like that. So. So that's how I see Kubernetes. So now let's look at how Kops is designed. I'm ignoring scheduler and things like that, yeah. Uh, so Kops, again, we have uh, a client app that we use on our laptop, and we have a state store, except it's not etcd, it's S3 or Google uh, uh, Cloud Storage. We send manifest. There's no API server. We store them directly into the, the, the bucket. And there is a up, up cloud up controller, which runs on the node. Um, actually, sorry, CloudUp is the one that talks to the cloud provider. It's a part of Chaos. So it's actually a library within Chaos. There's no API server. Um, so that one talks to the cloud provider, either to the cloud provider or also 
to Terraform. So I can use Chaos to generate Terraform. So, and then create my resources. So once I've uh, created all of the cloud resources, um, the nodes that start, get started have a certain boot sequence uh, as designed by Chaos um, uh, like this. So the first thing that runs uh, on your node will be a node up component that will download your, your cluster manifest, your cluster definition, and um, also prepare like um, if you have any assets that you need to copy onto your nodes, or you want to install packages, or you want to do things, um, you can customize that. There's hooks that you can um, specify for your Kubernetes uh, cluster generation. And then uh, sets up Protocube, which um, Protocube manages the etcd volumes. So that, that does the auto recovery of etcd. And then uh, also sets up um, everything that the kubelet needs. So it will render all of the manifests to run um, Kubernetes components like um, yeah, uh, kube proxy and things like that. Um, so before, what we used to do was using systemd units, and we copy them in, into the core OS. Now uh, we just define a manifest, and um, basically the node up component takes care of all of that. Um, OK. Uh, after the, no the kubelet comes up, it will look at the, um, it will say that hey, I need a, uh, I need a, a, a subnet for my uh, containers, for my pods. And basically, the kube controller will notice that request and then allocate a, a subnet for the node. And then uh, the kubelet will uh, start the container runtime, which can be Docker, can be something else. Actually, we're using Docker. Um, with that particular um, CIDR allocated or subnet allocated. And then kubelet handles um, and reports basically the rest. Basically, it plays the normal role of being the node agent. So that's basically covering two parts of uh, Chaos. So basically, how do we create the cloud resources? How do we provision the nodes and, and, and join them to the cluster? And then uh, finally, um, how do we manage add-ons on top of Kubernetes? How do we uh, install the DNS, the dashboard, autoscaler configuration, things like that? Uh, so for this, Chaos comes with an embedded component called channels. But you can also build it separately, and you can play with it yourself. So that's what we did at Onusby. We basically defined our own channel. I, I call it Beekeeper. And in there, we specify, like, oh, whenever our cluster comes online, we want to have Tiller, which is a core component of Helm. So uh, as soon as our bootstrap uh, completed, we want to be able to do Helm, uh, use Helm to install the rest of our, 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 uh, our software our, on top of our cluster, right? So apart from that, we also provision namespaces. Uh, so like every development team uh, or every project may have its own namespace. So we isolate um, and control access by namespace. We use uh, strong RBAC um, policies that only give access to what they need to have and only have access within their namespace. Um, and we use it integrated with um, our GitHub authentication. So if a developer logs in, he can access only the namespace that belongs to his GitHub team. So. Um, that's how we use um, that. We all bootstrap with channels and other things, uh, autoscaler and things like that. OK, so COPS channels, KOPS channels is basically to bootstrap and manage core Kubernetes add ons. That's what it's, its purpose is. The documentation is very, very limited. Uh, but if you spend some time to play with it, um, I found it actually quite powerful. Um, and basically, the way we do it, we just uh, apply a certain channel, which is our own add-ons channel. And then it will tell us, like, OK, um, currently you have um, namespaces version 1.1.1. And the one that you are in, in is in the upstream channel, or the stable channel that you're watching, is 1.1.2. So we're going to update. So you can manage updates. So you're, it's kind of like Helm templated manifests, uh, except it's like a bulk apply, like uh, for easy for a bootstrap. So um, I thought it was great, so we used it. It also allows us to get all the add-ons that are installed. So this is uh, one of our clusters uh, at the time had the core. I mean, there's a couple of, of add-ons that come from the uh, KOPS state store, the S3 bucket. And uh, we have like the bootstrap. There's a bootstrap channel that KOPS uses. And then we have a couple that we uh, bootstrapped uh, on top of that. And then we have the ones that are part of our uh, beekeeper channel. So we, can, we have a couple there, like uh, state metrics and things like that. Um, state metrics, you could use Helm to install it. But because it required some customization or we needed to have it before Helm, for that reason, we added it to the, uh, 
channel. So at some point, you have to decide what goes in as a channel add-on and what goes in as a Helm bootstrap. Right? Um, as soon as you have Helm, you could use Helm for everything else. Like as soon as you have uh, Tiller, basically. OK. So um, as part of our onboarding in our team, I created uh, a Terraform workshop, which is a public repository. And in there, I have a, a sub, uh, dir a sub um, directory that basically, uh, this is the, the workshop, that basically goes over like, OK, uh, what is KOps? Um, this whole directory has a Terraform plan to create nodes uh, to play with. And then within the node, you get KOps, you get all everything ready. And you can just go ahead and play with it and execute the commands directly. So I've um, created here one of the nodes. And I probably need to make it bigger. Is it visible? Is it visible on the, on the everywhere? So right now, I have like a B01 cluster. I have an SVC cluster, and I have B01. So there's a couple of auto-scaling group. Um, so the first thing is to, to create, a, uh, basically run KOps to create a cluster. Here I'm passing in. This is an imperative command, right? Um, I imperative, the same way like you do kubectl run, it's going to create a deployment. It's going to create a, the deployment's going to create a replica set. Pods are going to start. So with KOps, you can do imperative commands. And, um, and in this case, it takes care of uh, defining the cluster manifest, generating secrets for it, uploading everything your, to your state store in S3, and basically taking care of that. It didn't create the cluster, right? It just defined the cluster. In my command, I didn't tell it to create the cluster. If I did yes, it would go ahead and create the cluster. But because uh, one, of the, um, one of the targets here is um, to, to, I mean, everything in Kubernetes you can do imperatively or declaratively. Ideally, you use declarative statements. You define uh, what is your memory you, um, you know, limits. You don't tweak them and then don't store them. How do you recreate it without, without having it stored on, on, on the source control? So what we do is we actually get the cluster definition generated by uh, KOps, so I can get that. Oops, oh, whatever just done. Okay. So I just get, and then I can get my B01, uh, B03 cluster. And it basically defines all of the things that um, this is def a lot of defaults. Some of the parameters were customized by me through the flags, and it basically is a YAML document. Uh, that defines like um, I'm going to use an etcd cluster. This is going to be API access going to be available publicly. Um, SSH is also publicly open. Um, this is a subnet allocated and all that, right? Uh, defaults are not always good. Uh, there's an interesting KubeCon talk about a researcher um, from Red Hat who talked ab uh, about the security of clusters. One of his projects was to address uh, insecure defaults for a lot of these projects. So KOps in version 1.8, the latest version, has um, you know, changed a lot to make it more secure by default. Still, you, you will need to review a lot of the defaults. I mean, you need to be aware of what you do uh, when you create your own clusters, right? Um, so this was the cluster manifest. And uh, there's also instance group manifest. And if you want to read more about it, again, the, the repository is um, open source. And I mean, the links are there. You can uh, quickly read, a lot of, uh, read about it. I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, so the next thing that we do, we love, as I said several times, Terraform. So we actually generate, uh, we use a KOps to then read the manifest and then generate a Terraform configuration for that manifest. So um, it actually reads all of our AWS configuration and uh, goes ahead and creates the, if I read, if I do, is there a tree? Yeah. So we have a module um, and we have a cluster. Uh, basically, the way that my command was, was to output it into a module directory under a cluster directory under its cluster name. So that's where it was created. This is the cluster name. And within this particular um, directory, we have the whole Terraform config to create this cluster. After that, I create a mon an, um, Terraform configuration file 
to import this module. So I can use this Terraform configuration file to create multiple clusters, right? I can just use KOps to generate the Terraform configurations, create multiple modules, import them in here, and then I can create like as many clusters as I want, just using Terraform uh, apply. Oh, well, I'm lucky because I ran this earlier. Uh, I need to initialize and then plan out. The plan is not important, but the, apply, the init was important. Luckily, I ran it before, so no error. Uh, this is going to take a while. So maybe while this is bootstrapping, I mean, the actual resources doesn't, don't take so long. It's actually until the API server creates its DNS records and becomes available that takes a little bit. So I'm just going to move on with the slides. Oops. Where are the slides? Here. Right. One of the big issues that we had, um, we just used the defaults. <laughs> and one of the defaults is uh, 172, the, 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 the subnet. Um, I'd maybe here. Oh, let me go to the workshop cops folder and cut the B. OK. So one of the defaults is to use this subnet, 172.20.0.0.16. Uh, so the funny thing is Docker allocates this subnet. I mean, uses uh, the Docker bridge uses this subnet. So suddenly, some nodes were working, some weren't. What was going on? Right? We didn't know. So um, don't use the defaults. So be careful. <laughs> Um, that had us busy for at least a week to recreate <laughs> things. Um, then, as I advise, use declarative manifests. Don't just use the imperative COPS, uh, KOPS CLI. I think the, the strength of KOPS is to basically give you the ability to check in the manifest and to track changes and to manage them uh, through source control. Uh, make sure to reserve resources for your uh, kubelet, docker, and system. As um, York was highlighting earlier, um, we had some problems with Elasticsearch taking up all memory and then basically killing the Docker uh, runtime and then all of the pods dying. So um, by default, a lot of cluster bootstrap doesn't allocate resources for, um, for the actual kubelet, for the node agent and for the system. So if you, let's say you're running a node with 16 gigabytes of memory, a lot of these things, they say like you have 16 gigabytes of memory to the Kubernetes scheduler. And if you have some pods that um, you know, either don't have a, a limit set or you, you basically use all of the memory, then they will use all the memory and kill everything else. So you need to make sure that there is enough memory on CPU available for your other components uh, that you are running there. OK. Um, so. Let's, I wanted to highlight some of these. Where, is, where are they? Here, I think. So this is basically one, one that we did not, not too long ago, um, which is um, precisely this setup. We use uh, KOPS uh, 1.8 that allows us to upload assets uh, on, top of on, on our nodes, so part of the node up. As I mentioned, one of the bootstrap components of KOPS is to run Node app. And Node app watches the manifest. And basically, it's like a system, the kind of like we, it's like a cloud init, right? You just pull in a, a unit. And, uh, and in this case, I'm defining uh, the slice for the pod runtime. So I'm saying, um, yeah, the resources that are uh, used for Kubernetes services will be this much. So that's the kubelet. All of the Kubernetes services, QProxy, anything that runs within, the within a container that's part of the Kubernetes core system, is, uh, it's called the pod runtime. In my case, I'm calling it the pod runtime. So I'm giving it, um, I'm defining the slice. And then uh, after that, you need to define the, the, the C group, basically, the control group. And um, another one is the system slice. But we're not, we're not allocating system slice. Um, yeah, but this already solved a, a lot of our issues. Um, so what do we do? We, we tell the, the master kubelet that for the masters, it will use the C group. So the kubelet will run on the C group. And um, we are saying that um, if you have not enough memory available, um, 
you will you will get evicted. So by default, the Cuban the Keops sets the sets the eviction for 100 megabytes free memory. But if you have 16 gigabytes of uh, memory and you only have 100 left, and only then it starts evicting uh, pods, um, you're basically it's too late. Like the the node is already dying. So we had to you have to they advise you to use a certain percentage like uh, of your total memory. So we adjusted it based on our our nodes, which basically have uh, a lot more memory. So we, we allocate uh, 750 megabytes. If we cross that barrier, then the Kubernetes schedule will start evicting nodes to make sure that the nodes don't die. Um, next, the like I said, the queue preserved. This only works if you also create a, a, a C group for it. And by default, um, there is none. So you have to create the C group like using systemd um, slice uh, definitions. So I've, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to do a blog post about this um, to, get to explain this in more detail. There's also a couple of chaos issues that, that I can uh, link to that explain this deeper. But this was, um, I mean, even when I was like, working on this, I could see that pull requests for Azure Container Service were just barely a couple of days old. I mean, it looks like almost nobody either faces this issue or sets these defaults. I don't know. <laughs> so it was interesting. And that's why I wanted to highlight it. You can, but you can hint to Kubernetes how you want it, how the preference that you want it to evict. So if you, if you give, if you set the resource request exactly the same as the limit, it puts yep. it in as guaranteed right. class, which means it'll be at the bottom of the stack when, mm -hmm. it, when it comes to eviction. But I suppose if your node's locked up, then yeah. Then in in our happen. case, the problem was really that our container runtime was dying. Oh. Yeah, so we, di we, di we didn't allocate any memory and CPU for the container runtime or the Kubernetes components. Okay. So that's the problem. So this is what we did. We created a C group that is allocated to Docker and to uh, Kubelet, and we give it a minimum of this much memory. So that is not available for Kubernetes to schedule. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's why we, we, we basically give it a guarantee uh, for those uh, system components using this. Uh, so we use Keops, and on top of that, we build a whole bunch of Terraform around it, uh, because um, by itself, Terraform, uh, sorry, by itself, Keops requires a bunch of things like an S3 bucket. Uh, it requires uh, yeah, uh, other things, a, a subdomain. So you need to set up. A, I mean, we are on AWS. We can get that easily uh, with Terraform. So we just set up a, a sub a subdomain in Route 53. We uh, we set up. Um, S3 buckets, we set up TLS keys, everything that Keops needs before it starts um, are all managed, uh, are all created by a Terraform module. And when that Terraform module is done, creates a VPC, creates everything, then we run Keops to create the cluster inside the VPC. Then we set up like VPC peering and a bunch of other things. Um, I'm maybe skipping this, but this is basically how our uh, design looks. Like, um, um, basically, we are creating a Kubernetes cluster per availability zone. Uh, initially, we were running cross availability zones, but uh, that's not really recommended. And if you're running at CD and you're running three nodes, you're always going to have a majority within one availability zone. So if that majority goes down, you're losing your consensus and you, you need to recover anyway. So that's not really high availability. Definitely not in, in Singapore because we only have two availability zones. If you were in another region, we could have three availability zones and we could run an etcd one node per availability zone and then maybe we have less concerns. Uh, but in our case, we were, we were running a lot of etcd nodes and masters. I mean, so we decided like we might as well run a cluster per availability zone and then we look at federation. So uh, right now we are not using the uh, Kubernetes federation and I've talked to a lot of people about it and I can tell you why we're not using it, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Uh, but what we're doing is we're, we're setting up um, ingress, um, so nginx in ingress or whatever ingress control you want to use, load balancer, and then we set up Route 53 uh, weighted routes to across the two clusters with health checks and things like that. So uh, that works great for stateless services, but Elasticsearch will be a bit more complicated, as, uh, as uh, York, um, like told me. Like, Dude, you're not thinking <laughs> about Elasticsearch. <laughs> um, so... Um, also, part of the Keops uh, provisioning is that it provisions a bastion for us. So Keops, I mean, the tool Keops doesn't, but our Terraform module does. So our Terraform module creates a bucket, creates a bastion, creates the VPC, creates subnets, 
creates utilities, things like that. So we, we wrap that all around uh, KOps to, to basically create our infrastructure. Um, we provide some utility uh, databases which are used for shared um, services, kind of. Um, idea, obviously, for microservices, we have dedicated uh, storage. But for um, staging environments, maybe we just share a, a, an RDS instance and things like that. So we, we try to re save on resources there. So, so we have some utilities there. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I, this is very detailed about our uh, setup. I wasn't going to, uh, I thought I removed that slide. <laughs> um, I covered everything about COPS manifest. Here are a couple of examples, and I'm pretty much done. I mean, we can go back to the actual cluster that I created. Um, OK, so this is an example of what, why you want to check in your KOps manifest, right? I mean, we're changing the, the, no, the, ima the machine type. Just a commit and then apply. That's it. Uh, we are adding text so our autoscalers can automatically detect the nodes and automatically scale up and down our autoscaling group. So these are in KOps and manifest, you attach cloud labels. So we just uh, assign this information and boom. Um, the autoscaler auto discovers it and automatically scales up the autoscaling group. Awesome. Did I say auto much? <laughs> um, then we have alpha API flags enabled. Just another. Yeah, I think this is the same if you use uh, system unit files, right? But I kind of like uh, this kind of setup. Yeah. Uh, I didn't cover channels yet. OK. Yeah, so the, the prerequisites, I, like I mentioned, the S3 bucket, SSH keys, VPC, bastion hosts, and a hosted zone. That's basically everything I mentioned. Um, before we run KOps, we need to have these things, so we use Terraform to provision this. Then the bootstrap module is basically what we use to, to bootstrap with the channel. So we bootstrap Tiller, which is the server-side component of Helm. So when you, when, you do, when you use Helm and you need to install, uh, for example, you want to Helm install Datadog, because we use Datadog, but there's a public uh, chart. We just do Helm install Datadog, and it needs Tiller to be available. So we need to bootstrap before that, um, things like that. And after that, we also so we bootstrap a bunch of fundamentals, and then we bootstrap charts using just a simple Bash script to set up Datadog, like I said. OK, so I didn't really highlight it, but the, the logo that I showed you is actually part of a competition that they're currently running. Uh, you can vote. If you don't like it, maybe you can change to something else. But I think they're pretty much finalized. So um, that was just something I saw. So soon I'll have swag because I'm like, I became a huge fan. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe, I mean, that's pretty much everything I have. So I'll just uh, like, let's see if this came up. They are up eight minutes. Uh, I timed it kind of all right. <laughs> Sorry? Running the Kube API to proxy in the container itself, or you basically deploy it on this? I think the proxy is running in a container as well. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember off the top of my head. Kube says okay, no, it's dash n. Kube says to protect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, sorry. Just this n. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, the kubelet is not uh, self-hosted, uh, so the kubelet is a system that you need them, I guess. Yeah. Docker is not self-hosted, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So one more thing, because it's so cool. Um, I'm going to use this tool, right? So part of this thing is how do you use this channels tool? So this is really small. So this is like a we go our beekeeper, beekeeper channel has the following add-ons. So we have a namespace add-on. Uh, so part of the add-ons, we, we part of the channel definition, we have the name, which is Tiller. And then we have the actual location of the manifest, which is the Kubernetes 1.7 YAML manifest, which applies to Kubernetes versions like this. So if we were to maintain multiple clusters, our channels can like say, oh, we have 1.8 cluster. I hope so. <laughs> um, and then. Um, we basically can maintain the same channel, but maybe make some changes for 1.8 and then just run channels apply. So our namespace channel basically looks something like this. This is a not, a not really the one that we use at the moment. Uh, it's outdated. So we create a namespace. We create an RBAC role for, uh, for example, the namespace is fr front end. So there will be a manager 
basically people that belong to the correct GitHub team adopt this role when they log in, and they're able to do like uh, on pretty much everything inside this uh, meme space. The same, um, then we bind anything. This is basically RBAC. And the same for backend, and uh, well, this is just namespace back, uh, RBAC setup. But we also bootstrap Tiller in the namespace. This is the old setup where we bootstrap Tiller at the cube system level. This is not really good because it gives anybody with Tiller access full access across all namespaces. So this is, this is not how we do it anymore. Uh, but basically, using this channels tool, I can just. So if I go channels apply, I, I say I, I apply the dashboard. So basically, it says uh, dashboard is located under the GitHub user content Kubernetes code master. So that's an upstream dashboard, right? So I'm, I'm not maintaining that. Um, and if I want to, that's. Copy this like uh, the monitoring. Uh, you need to monitor. You need to bootstrap the the monitoring to have heapster and things like that. Well, let's not go into that right now. And I'm going to bootstrap um, all of the honestly um, add-ons. Basically, that's just this one channel apply. So when I do this, he's saying, okay, uh, I'm installing all of the namespaces that you need. So Tiller. I'm creating. Um, Cube state metrics, whatever we want. This is only a fraction of the, the, the add ons that we use. I just copy pasted a few. And um, yeah, now if I do, and I do. Um, Save from them. Obviously, we have the front end manager. Um, Channels kind of, I mean, interesting to, to know is that it uses annotations on the on the namespace to keep track of your versions. So if I uh, if I describe like if I do um, give me the cube system namespace and give me the annotations on that namespace where I will select wherever it contains add-ons, then show me the actual uh, JSON like it, it, there's a JSON blob inside, so I'm extracting the JSON blob, re, re evaluating that, and then extracting just the version. So it shows me the key and the version of that uh, particular add on that's installed. Um, so um, obviously, I don't need to do that. I can just do channels get add ons, I think. And it basically gives me the same information, it gives me also where it came from. Um, so channels basically is a way to manage that. And um, it's not very, very well documented within the uh, Keops um, repository, so I will probably try to share more of this information upstream. Okay, uh, I don't have anything else to say really. So, questions? Keops yeah. runs only on AWS, right? Sorry? Keops is only for AWS. I, I think they support, definitely in the last version, they support multiple clouds. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was also an interesting. Um, there was an interesting uh, sound cut. Uh, uh, how you say when they do an interview and they just only voice like audio block? Sound bite. Some. I mean, podcast? they were just in. Podcast. Hmm? Podcast. Yeah, podcast. Okay. Yeah, there was kind of a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> podcast about um, with the the uh, core maintainers of Keops about the future, and they're actually looking at um, building out Keops to manage also uh, ma hosted solutions. So use KOps to create uh, as your container service uh, cluster, and use KOps to create other clusters. So um, that's one of the like that's one of the things they mentioned of where they would like to take this. Uh, I think if I go to releases, the last one, uh, one point eight, um, they have better support for like GC, oh. um, early support for digital ocean. I mean, yep, uh, lots of interesting stuff. Yeah, uh, I think the advantage with using this, I mean, we did try to run things very like hands-on, manage things manually, but after a while you start to realize it becomes too complicated, right? And then this is kind of like going from compiling your own kernel to choosing a distribution. Uh, we are choosing the Keops distribution, so we have a lot of our problems taken care of. Still, the easier way would be to actually run like uh, on top of like fully fully hosted solution if you if you can do that. Um, yeah. Mm, any other questions? In terms of bare metal, I don't think this Keops is at all targeting bare metal. <laughs>
Sectonic yeah, is, right? Like I said, uh, well, ty Typhoon is the unbranded version of Tectonic. It does feel like that. Like without, it's like the Tectonic vanilla, but without uh, any of the crap. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> no. So it's the same order. Yeah. It's the same it's developer really cool. CoreOS. I'm surprised to see that, though, that they have this CoreOS guy that wrote Tectonic, the commercial offering, mm -hmm. then come out with like a com kind of, I mean, not really competing, but like a open source version of it. I found that strange, but it's awesome. Mm. Yeah. Any I'll other questions? It. I think the most important part here for me was, I mean, even if you don't use Kops to provision the cluster, you can still use channels to bootstrap the initial part. Like what I wanted to highlight, apart from just like we are going to create a cluster, is once you created a cluster, how do you bootstrap the rest? And that's kind of what um, what we did with channels. I'm not saying it's the best tool, but it. It's better than what Tectonic did um, back in, in August, at least when I was looking at it. Tectonic was a bash script that basically bootstrapped like, everything in a loop. And uh, I, f I thought Channels was way better than that. It basically picks up all of the YAML manifests, renders them, and fires them up at, at the API. And you manage them like that. I thought that was uh, an improvement on top of Tectonic. Um, so that's why um, that was awesome. I was actually thinking even of taking Channels and using it for Tectonic Vanilla or something like that. <laughs> Anyway, okay. All right. Welcome.